Um, this is fluid status in the ICU. This is one of my favorite things to talk about, um, although maybe I said about a lot of things because it's uh, what I like to think is kind of the last art of medicine. Not the last, but it's definitely a major part of it uh, in medicine because fluid status in the ICU is there's no hard and fast rule for any of it. And evaluating fluid status is really, really, really hard um, because there is no, oh, look at this. He has an elevated white count neutrophils and therefore he is probably septic and he has fevers. You know, your white count is a composite of a lot of things. So the, the equivalent when I'm discussing fluid status and here is anybody that uh, has ever practiced anesthesia is I equate it to doing a Malampati score. And I know it seems kind of ridiculous and to anybody who doesn't know what that is, your Malampati score is the test where you look inside someone's mouth and you have them open up and you have them stick their tongue out and look at the insides uh, and, and look at the back of the airway. And really when we, when we do our airway evaluation, while we do our Malampati score, even though that's kind of the big thing that's taught, it's really just one aspect of the larger portion of kind of what's going on. Because really in the back of our heads or sometimes in the front of our heads, we're looking at our patient, we're saying, yeah, they have a Malampati score of two. Okay, great. Well, what about all the other factors that are relevant? So what else do we look at? We look at their incisor distance, or like the size of their mouth. We look at their thyromental distance from their chin to their thyroid. You know, we look at how far back their neck can move. And even if we're not consciously like checking off a box on these things, we're thinking about each one of them and taking it as a composite of, of a larger picture and saying, okay, what do all of these different pieces tell us about what their airway and intubation might be like? And so we do the same thing when we're looking at fluid status in the ICU. And we, we take a big, lots of different pieces and we look at it and we say, well, what do we think based off of the, you know, different evidence that we have? And so this is kind of where we're going to get started. So <clears throat> the first thing that I'm going to bring up uh, is labs. Um, and this is interesting because there is no one lab, obviously, that is going to tell us like, oh, our patient is dry. So, you know, what kind of things are we going to look at? Well, for example, when we look at our labs, we're going to say, are we dilute? Does it look like our, you know, hemoglobin is um, super up and our platelets are up and our uh, white count is up and all of our cell lines look like they're kind of jumping up. Does it look like we've lost volume and therefore our blood is more dilute and so our hemoglobin and stuff looks like it jumped up? What is uh, things like our creatinine and our uh, BUN to creatinine ratio, which will tell us kind of things like, you know, what is our, wh what are our kidneys kind of seeing and doing? What is our blood doing as, you know, in, as it relates to our kidneys? Does it look like it's pre-renal? Does it look like it's intrarenal or post-renal if we're having some type of renal dysfunction? It kind of gives us a hint as to what our volume status looks like at that point in time. Um, you know, the other things we look at with our labs are things just like our, um, you know, electrolytes. So when we look at our electrolytes, and again, we're looking at the same kind of idea as our, you know, hemoglobin and our uh, platelets, but we're doing the same thing as it pertains to things like sodium and potassium and, uh, you know, chloride, everything else that's kind of in our blood. We're looking to see what our concentrations kind of look like. And across the board, if it looks like, oh, everything looks like it's jumping up and our creatinine looks like it's rising and it looks like, you know, as a whole, we are dilute and all of our things look like they're coming up. That might be a hint from our labs that our patient might be kind of intravascularly dry and recognizing that volume status, we're usually talking about intravascularly, not necessarily their, um, you know, total volume, which could be in their gut, could be in their lungs, could be in their abdomen, could be everywhere. So the first thing we're going to kind of look at is labs and see whether or not that that traces kind of with what we what we think when we're looking at our patient. Uh, I'm getting to CVP Rishi, I promise. Don't worry. Um, so the next thing we're going to look at, and this is big, and it, it always kind of seemed silly to me when I was in medical school, and then I kind of grew up a little bit when I got to uh, residency, but I still was like, eh, not really. And then especially in the ICU, the history and the physical. I mean, it seems kind of like, oh, of course we're going to look at the patient, but it's really, especially in the ICU, looking at the patient and kind of what do we mean by things like that? Well, the first thing is just the eye test. And I kind of like doing it like this because I need some type of art here, but look at the patient, just 
Take a look with your eyeballs and say, what does this person look like? Does their tongue look dry? Do their, does their face look you know, shrunken into their eyes, look kind of sunken into their head? What do we do when we have babies in the NICU and things like that, or when they're dehydrated, are their fontanelles sunken in? And so just looking at our patients, what do their tongue look like? What do their mucous membranes look like? Um, things like that immediately off the bat kind of give you a hint as to what their fluid status is like. And remember, again, I want to emphasize, not one of these things is going to give you an answer, but these are all the things we're going to kind of put together to make our picture. The next thing kind of with this, you know, cap refill. Um, actually, this is probably a good opportunity for me to draw my disgusting finger, um, which is not very good. Um, so we're going to look at our cap refill, you know, take their finger. And I know we learned this at some point, you know, just kind of push on it. Does the, does the color come back quickly? Does it look like they're, they have a good robust movement of, of fluid back into it, but you displace it by pushing on it. And again, it's not a, um, uh, it's, it's not a definitive thing, but it's another piece of evidence that's going to give you an idea of whether or not these patients are, you know, kind of dry or, or robustly filled. Um, we'll go over the evidence for provocative dynamic tests and three seconds or less. Yes. Um, so we want to see that they're refilling relatively quickly. So, um, you know, other things like turgor, you know, again, we heard this word in medical school and I know we've repeated it. They have poor skin turgor and it tents and, you know, you pull on it and it stays up and it's like, yeah, well, in the ICU, these things are, are relatively uh, important because um, your patients are sick and they're intravascularly dry and you need to get a good idea of kind of what they're like. Um, you know, urine. I know it seems silly and I never thought when I was a child I'd be evaluating people by how much pee they were making, but looking at what their urine output's doing, again, not a sole indicator, but if they're making urine and they have normal, otherwise rel relatively normal kidneys, they should be peeing because they should have blood flowing through the glomeruli being filtered and making urine. So these things are important. But the other thing we have to mention here is the history part. And listening to the story is so important. Where the patient came from, maybe they come in from a nursing home. You know, they're, they have dementia. They haven't been eating for two or three days. They haven't been drinking. Maybe they've been acting different and they're altered at home. And, you know, the daughter or wife or whoever they live with say, you know, they've been acting really strange recently or they've been vomiting for days, you know, vomiting. I feel like I have to write something, um, you know, uh, all these kinds of things all kind of tie in together. And they say, you know, does that story make sense? with what we're looking at at our patient. The patient that's been vomiting for three days, hasn't been keeping anything down, isn't um, you know, uh, drinking anything, has been having lots of stool and bowel movements, and then you go and look at them and you say, oh, they have poor cap refill, you know, their, their eyes look sunken, their face looks you know, kind of sucked in, and, and they look pale, you know, pallor, things like that. Uh, we're gonna look at that, and those are all gonna be clinical hints. So history and physical exam, super important, even though we learned it once upon a time, and I know I was excited when I was a med student, got to go see real patients, and then I was kind of over it when I was an intern, and then, you know, after that, exactly, eyes and nose. Um, the next thing we're gonna look at is imaging. Um, and imaging can be super important, and it can tell you a lot, but it can also lead you astray. And please remember, all of these things, while they can give you great information, can also be very confounding. We're gonna kind of put the picture together at the end. But for imaging, we have things like our chest x-rays, which we get in the ICU. Please remember, don't get daily chest x-rays. The evidence is very clear. You do not need daily chest x-rays in the ICU if patients are intubated unless there's a reason to get it. There's a change in something, there's a change in respiratory, something. But our chest x-rays, when we're looking for volume status, do they look overloaded? You know, do their lungs look like they're overloaded? Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I should have mentioned in the history and physical, I talked all about um, how dry they look, but do they look anisarchic? Do they look swollen? You know, these are, again, all things that will help us and possibly lead us astray of what their fluid status is like. But chest x-ray, does our chest x-ray look overloaded? If they've had a CT scan, can we see whether or not they're overloaded? And maybe they're not. And again, uh, it, it's all another kind of hint as to whether or not, you know, where this patient stands. But the big thing, and obviously anybody listening, I know Rishi's a fan in critical care now and other people, is our bedside echo. And this is one of the um, most important things, not just bedside, but echo in general, is being able to look at a patient and be able to uh, and, and put it in and say, you know what, what does their IVC look like? And I know, again, IVC is not a great metric on its own. And I want to emphasize that none of these things on their own, but does it fit the picture? Does our patient that has elevated electrolytes and have poor skin turgor and, and dry mucous membranes have a collapsible IVC? Um, 
you know, is it less than 1.5 centimeters or is it really engorged and it doesn't fit with what's going on with the rest of the picture? So we have to kind of take these things and put them together. And with our bedside echo, we can look at their lungs. Do they have B lines? Do, is their heart full? Is the right side of their heart full? Is the left side of their heart full? All these kinds of things put into it. And then we can look at things like their abdomen. If we think they have ascites, do they have volume inside them? So all of these kinds of things we're going to, again, put together and look and say, does it all make sense? And kind of the last thing here, and please feel free to chime in, people, if you think that I'm missing something. But the last thing is kind of hemodynamic monitoring. And this is also super important, not just for di... Oh, I spelled it wrong. Um, so these are things like, you know, our A-line. Uh, you know, what about our A-line? Well, what does our pulse pressure look like? What kind of pulse pressure variation do we have? You know, pulse pressure variation or just our... Uh, uh, a-line waveform. You know, these are things that are going to tell us. Um, again, IVC, uh, again, back with imaging, but when, sometimes we put swans in. Sometimes we um, transduce the um, uh, CVP, which, again, I'm going to go back to this, and I'm going to say it a million times. CVP is not good as a static number. Bedside echo for, for um, IVC diameter is not a good solitary number. Trending these things can be very helpful, especially, again, if it fits your picture. I'm not saying go out, get CVP on everybody and say, oh, their CVP is uh, 22, they must be volume overloaded. But does that idea of what their CVP looks like fit with everything else? And it definitely depends on where we are and what we're looking at. Uh, and then we have other really cool devices now, things like the Vigileo, uh, which I will uh, reserve my my um, opinions on, uh, and things like the Cheetah, which I don't actually know how to spell, but I'm going to just write it as Cheetah, um, which are different types of monitors that look at electroimpedance across the body, and they can tell you what kind of fluids are like based off of how fast the signal travels from one side of the, uh, to the other. Um, you know, these are really cool machines. Sometimes people say they're random number generators, and sometimes they can be trended, who knows? Um, you know, the, the validation is not great at the moment, I don't think. Um, even things like our O2, you know, our pulse ox, it gives you a waveform. And the reason is that the pulse ox is dependent on a pulse. It's dependent on some amount of volume moving and then, uh, you know, giving you an idea of what that pulse looks like and what that volume status looks like. Um, and so, uh, and someone also brought up left ventricular and diastolic pressure. Exactly. And this goes with anything with our swarm. We're going to look at the pressures in the pulmonary artery. Is the pulmonary artery have high pressures? Does the left ventricular and diastolic pressure super high? Is your... Um, you know, uh, which is your left atrial pressure, and you have a story of a patient that has a, a poor EF. And so all of these things, evaluating fluid status in the ICU is hard. It's tough. There's not a good single way to do it. That's the reality of it. But what I mentioned kind of at the beginning is there is some type of art to this. And the kind of one important point that uh, I think plays into this is really understanding, oh, I want my blue pen, is that Fluids equal medicine. And I know it's kind of ridiculous, and I hope you've all heard this at some point, but fluids have electrolytes. They have sodium. They have volume to them. We all know that volume overload has worse outcomes in the ICU and just in the hospital in general. And fluids are medicine. And anytime you give patients fluids, if it's LR, if it's normal saline, if it's blood products, if it's anything, it has ramifications. And so understanding the volume status of our patient and knowing what we're going to do with it is so, so, so important. Um, how about fluid status evaluation and continuous flow physiology? Um, that would be something, Rishi, I would like if you would be interested in doing a, a joint uh, video uh, we should talk about because I have no idea um, all I know is in the cardiac ICU, it's diuresis, 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 and heart failure. Um, that was kind of the one thing I was taught there more than anything. Um, but yeah, we'll talk and we should definitely talk about some of the bad stuff because I'm super excited about getting into that in just five months. But we need to recognize that fluid status is very difficult in the ICU. It's, it's very up in the air. And it's like I said at the beginning, it's, it's the art of it. It's taking each one of these and understanding how each one of them interplay with one another and recognizing, well, you know, the patient looks super anisarchic. We know he has liver failure. His abdomen is super distended and he has a whole bunch of ascites in there. 
but we look at his heart, it's hyperdynamic. We know patients with liver failure get, you know, a lot of leakage into their, their everywhere else. You know, maybe they're intravascularly dry. What can we do about that? And so looking at our fluid status, again, is not just looking at our Malampati score, like all of these things are single points. We're taking a composite of a whole bunch of different things. And if you're interested, I would look up the SARI score, which is um, you know, a composite index of all things for the airway, and that gives you kind of a point. But in the ICU, we don't go and look at patients and say, well, we got two points for this, and we got one point for this, and we got three points for this. It's, it's a, a culmination, and you cannot, I cannot tell you how many times we're in the unit and we're like, you know what, does he need some volume? Maybe they're septic, but their heart's not working great. We have to kind of go slow with it, but they also have liver failure. So, you know, everything we give them is going to go into their abdomen anyway, but we have to resuscitate them because you have to resuscitate your septic patients. Um, oh, I'm sorry, leg raising and fluid status. I almost forgot. That's probably one of the most important things is um, volume responsiveness. Um, so volume responsiveness, anybody that doesn't know, is a look at um, uh, whether or not the patient is fluid responsive, meaning that if you give them a bolus of like, uh, I think it's 500 of volume, or alternatively, you raise their legs up. Um, so you, there's a special way to do it. I'm not going to lean back in my chair here, but I suggest looking it up. So you don't have to actually give them volume. You can position them appropriately, lift their legs up, and you auto transfuse them volume into, you know, increases their preload. And um, it's a really great thing. It's super easy to do at bedside. And what we're looking at is for a 10 to 15% change, I'll put a delta here, uh, a 10 to 15% change, not in our pressure. I think that's a, I think that's a misnomer and I could be wrong, but you know, please feel free to double check me. It's in our cardiac output we're looking for. So we're looking for an, a, a drop in our pulse pressure variation when we do this and not necessarily in our pressure so much, but definitely looking at the change in pressure helps because as you, as you preload the heart, you get more blood to the right, you get more blood to the left, which is always going to, if your heart is working normally, get increased pressure as your output. But we wanna make sure that your difference in pulse pressure is really what matters. Um, as someone's pointing out, your stroke volume variation should go down. Um, I'm sorry if you can't see this on the drawing. I really need a better camera thing or someone to teach me how to do these better. But we're looking for a decrease in our stroke volume variation um, because that's what happens when in a well-resuscitated person. They don't have a normal stroke volume variation. Or, I'm sorry, a normal person doesn't have stroke volume variation for the most part. They should more or less have the same because... When we take deep breaths on normal, we shouldn't drop our pressure by more than 10 millimeters of, merc or millimeters of mercury, and that's illustrated in like tamponade physiology. But we need to understand that we're looking for a change in stroke volume variation and not necessarily just pressure. Although a lot of people just look at pressure because we don't necessarily have a great way of looking at SVB. Um, yes, cardiac output, you need some form of continuous cardiac. Exactly, and, and Rishi's 100% correct. And I usually look at that, or I, I'm gonna be honest, if we have 20 patients, I'm gonna eyeball it and just look at their at their wave and see if it looks like it's gotten better. Um, and if we had more reliable continuous output monitors, I think it would be much better. Um, can you discuss the evidence surrounding albumin versus balanced salt solution in a patient you deem to be volume down and need a fluid? Um, I will send me a message personally and I will talk to you about it. That's a whole video of its own. There are a number of studies and depending on your endpoint changes what you're gonna give sometimes. Um, and depending on your patient, liver patients, for example, are different than other patients, trauma patients who have major hemorrhages need blood instead of those products. Um, and so that's kind of its own thing. Um, but I definitely would love to do a talk about that. I think that's a great point. Um, CVICUs are moving away from Swan GANS catheters these days. So I can't speak to all of them. Uh, I will tell you that they're just a paper I think came out last year that said that in heart failure, Swans did, I think, change outcomes. Uh, if you send me a message, I will uh, get back to you about that. Um, but I, I will make sure. So people, people don't do swans for a couple of reasons. One, there was a, a study from like 1960, I think, that said it didn't change outcomes. It probably wasn't that long ago, but it said it didn't change outcomes. The issue that I have with that is generally, the swan is a monitor.